My name is Jessie. I'm 40 years old. I grew up in Batavia, Ohio. Um, I had a somewhat normal childhood. Um, my, our first house we lived in was in Norwood. Um, my family, my parents were still together. Um, both my parents are addicts. There was a home intruder one night when they were at a party and um, our grandma was babysitting us. She was in the basement doing laundry and is hard of hearing. So when the home intruders came in, she didn't hear them. Um, the first thing they saw was me. I was only four years old. They, I just remember being picked up by the neck and shook and woke up in my yard. Later, I found out that I was sexually assaulted after I was strangled and they had left me in the yard for dead. Um, this immediately gave me a window to blame myself for everything. Um, shortly after it happened, my parents moved to Batavia, so I thought moving was my fault. Uh, they got a divorce, so I thought the divorce was my fault. Um, the crime that happened to me, it's still unsolved. Um, my parents left the door unlocked, not realizing it. The police pretty much blame my parents, so it's basically a cold case. Um, if I would have been strangled for 10 more seconds, I would not be here today. Um, when we moved to Batavia, uh, my parents decided to hold me back after kindergarten because of the emotional trauma I'd been through. Um, this kind of opened the doors for how school was for me. I got picked on for being held back. Um, at Batavia, they had a really big playground where you would go in first grade, and then they had a small playground for kindergarten. So when I was still playing in the kindergarten playground, um, all the kids were picking on me that I was with in kindergarten. Uh, so growing up, I always felt different. I felt less than. I didn't feel like I fit in. Um, I was very awkward. I was quiet. Uh, my brother was always the popular one. We're only, we're like two years apart in age, I think. Um, like, he made the good grades, he played sports. Um, he, was, he was the popular kid. I was kind of just um, off on like a wallflower, basically. Um, going into high school, I was still a pretty good kid. Most I got in trouble for was grades um, and talking too much in school. So I didn't really get in trouble for behavior or anything like that. Um, my brother was a skateboarder. He started partying when he was like 15, I think. And um, him and his friends would use me when they had to get drug tests. I was the one that um, I would give them pee to pass these drug tests. Um, I would give them, like, I would cover for them while they were partying in our house so they wouldn't get in trouble or caught. Um, I got picked on so bad in high school that I decided to go to Live Oaks. I think if I would have stayed at my high school, I don't think I would have graduated. Um, I got picked on for having frizzy hair, red hair, big ears, having a hunchback, um, pretty much anything you could think of I got picked on for. Um, when I went to Live Oaks, it was like a fresh start. I think everybody at Live Oaks was some sort of an outcast or misfit. Um, so, you know, we all had that in common. They were all from different schools, so no one really knew me. Um, but when I started going to Live Oaks, that's when the doors opened for like partying for me. Um, I remember the first time I drank, it was uh, Zima with Jolly Ranchers in the bottles. And the first time I felt like a buzz from alcohol, it made my insecurities go away. It made my awkwardness go away. It gave me a warm feeling of acceptance. Uh, and I really liked that, um, which led to, you know, back then we drank like Boone's Farm and Mad Dog 2020, which was disgusting. But when you're underage, that's what we were able to get. Um, my addictions really started with boys. Um, you know, as an addict, we fill the void. I was always craving attention. So when I would meet a him, I would kind of start doing what they were doing. Um, my first serious boyfriend I met at Live Oaks, he had a fake ID. He was in a crappy band. Um, 
I thought that was great. Um, he started buying my friends and I alcohol. Um, we started smoking, but like on our first date, he took me to one of his friend's house and he was smoking marijuana. And I was so sheltered when I started dating him, when he started smoking the marijuana, I started crying thinking he was under the influence and could not drive me home in that condition. And um, that's what I remember of just being so sheltered. Like from what happened to me when I was little, my parents kept me in a bubble. I think they thought they were doing something good for me, but keeping me in this bubble made me very naive to the world and I just really didn't know what was going on. Um, so when you know, I got over him smoking and started smoking with him, um, I started taking it from my mom. And the good thing about being the good kid is when I would go in my mom's room and take her marijuana, she wouldn't accuse me because I was the good kid. She would accuse my brother. So um, got away with that for quite a while. Um, we, uh, his mom lived in California and he really wanted me to go with him to California to visit his mom. I was 18 at the time, but my parents did not want me to go. Um, so that made me want to go even more. Um, right before, like the day before the plane, like to go, my parents said, don't drink, don't get a tattoo, don't do drugs, uh, just be good. So in my head, it was like, okay, this is a checklist of all the things I'm gonna do when I get to California. So I got to California, I loved it there. It was my first time out of Batavia, like really out on my own. Um, my first night there, I, I got really drunk, um, was smoking, uh, having a great time. Um, I did get a tattoo when I was there. Um, then uh, one day we went to the beach and we did some mushrooms. I hated it. Um, I couldn't eat them. They just were awful. So my ex put them in a blender with some orange juice and vodka. So I had like a, a screwdriver with mushrooms in it. Um, I remember going to the beach on these mushrooms and I felt like I was on one of those um, carnival rides that just spins like crazy. So I was not a fan of the mushrooms. I did not do those again. Um, when we went back home, like things, things were different. Like I was really emotional. Um, the guy I was with, he wore a trench coat to school the day after the Columbine shootings because he thought it would be funny. Uh, he got expelled. So um, of course my family didn't want me to date him, which made me want to date him more. Um, we ended up parting ways. Um, you know, high school relationships are really intense for short periods of time. I think it was five months, but I was pretty, uh, I was pretty heartbroken about it. Um, after we broke up, I had discovered whippets. Um, so I did those a lot. I don't know why, they made me have a really bad headache. I think it's just because at 18, I was able to buy them. Um, the next him I dated, when I met him, he drank a lot, like a whole lot. Um, so I started drinking a lot. Uh, he did not treat me well, so being under the influence made it easier to be with him. I think I was with him like four years, um, but he opened like a lot of doors. Like I started drinking a lot. I started using benzos, um, started using ecstasy, acid, um, pretty much anything and everything I could get my hands on. Um, I started getting into the rave culture. This was back in like 2000 and I loved it. You could go to a rave, everybody was a misfit or they could be weird or whatever. And everybody was just non-judgmental and uh, drugs were easy to get. The music was great. So I, not only did I get addicted to like the lifestyle, but the whole culture of it, um, I loved. Um, this ex I was with though, he would send me with the money to go find like the pills or whatever we were gonna do. And he would make me do it first to make sure that the drugs were okay, which looking back, that's not really nice to do to your girlfriend to have her be the guinea pig for the drugs, but I didn't think it was a big deal. Um, the emotional and mental abuse had gotten so bad with him that I was only about 120 pounds and I could drink 12 shots in a night 
and was still okay. Um, you would think that would be enough for me to stop, but it wasn't. Um, he used to have these parties where everybody would do acid. He would sell the acid, and then everybody would do it at his house. Um, so every weekend, that's what I would do. There was one night, I'd, I'd had a couple hits of acid, but I wanted more. Back then, acid came in sweet breath vials, like they look kind of like eye drops, like that type of container. Um, so when I asked him if I could have more, um, he squeezed probably the whole bottle on my tongue, which was the, what was left was probably about 20 hits of acid. Normal person might spit that out, like that's not a good idea. Me, I didn't want to waste it, so I went ahead and swallowed it. This was probably the worst, worst experience of my life. I was um, crouched in a dark room in the corner, had my knees tucked against my chest. I was crying. I was seeing um, the shadow people from the movie Ghost everywhere. Uh, I was absolutely terrified. Uh, this ex, he came into the room and was screaming at me for crying. Um, you know, ha being experiencing a bad trip is bad enough on its own, but then having someone yell at you why you're feeling that way just really didn't help. Um, I was still tripping really hard in the morning, and I decided to go out into the woods with his cat because I thought I was supposed to die in the woods. I don't really know what I thought was going to happen, but... Something told me to go to the woods. So I took his cat for comfort um, and went and sat at this little shack he had made. And I kept looking up in the sky like, okay, uh, when am I gonna die? Who's gonna take me? I don't really know what my thought process was, but obviously I did not die. Um, you would have also thought that would have been enough for me to not do acid anymore, but it wasn't. I did acid again the next weekend. Um, I was with this man for like four years, and like I said, it was very abusive, not physical abuse, but he had me um, emotionally beaten down to think that I couldn't get any better than him. Um, I was a loser. He took care of me. So it was very hard to leave that relationship. Uh, I finally did leave the relationship. After I left the relationship, I started getting really into alcohol. Um, I was drinking till I blacked out a couple times a week. I just wanted to numb the pain. Like I didn't miss being with him, but I think I had to detox from him and like change my thinking process that I was worthy of somebody. And I had also had um, my first seizure at his house. Um, I had been doing Xanaxes all weekend and drank a bunch and I went home to my mom's. I was on the computer and I felt a wave go over my body. I went to yell out for help and my jaw stayed open, froze. And that's all I remember. Um, I couldn't yell for help, so I walked to our hallway and started punching a door to, so my mom could hear me. And next thing I know, I woke up in her lap. Um, I had no idea what happened to me. I didn't know what day it was. Um, I didn't know I had a seizure. Um, so this did scare me for a while. Like, I stopped drinking for a while. Um, I stopped going to raves for a little while. I saw a neurologist, started taking medicine. Um, that went on for like a year. I was doing okay. And then I decided, well, I haven't had a seizure in a while. I'm taking medicine. Um, I want to go back to raves. I want to go back to being a young person. So I started going to raves again and had met another him. He actually wasn't too bad. I kind of made him, influenced him. Usually it was the other way around. But there was this house in Clifton we would go to. Um, it was called the Mystery House, which in modern times it would probably be called a crack house. It was a big empty house in Clifton. A couple people lived upstairs, um, but they would let anybody and everybody come into the house and party. DJs would play. Um, it was, it was a cool place for us to hang out. There was a guy there, um, who offered me, um, shards, which back then shards was terminology for meth. And I'd said no, and he said it's free, um, you can try it. And you know, I'm the type of addict, if someone says free, I'm not going to say no. So I did them. I don't really know if I actually remember feeling high or not. Like, I couldn't stop talking. 
but I'm like that anyways, so it was hard to tell if it was the drugs or if it was just me. But I did want more. You know the way it goes, somebody will offer you stuff free once, and then when I wanted more, he was like, no, you gotta pay. I didn't have any money, so I didn't do any more. Um, that night, I went home to my friend Will's house. I was laying on the couch on the phone with a guy. I started stuttering really bad, and that's all I remember. I woke up to a paramedic pricking my finger to check my blood, um, like my, um, my sugar and my blood or whatever it is they do. And my friend Will was right over me screaming, are you okay? And I felt really bad because Will was on mushrooms that night. So not only did he have to deal with me having a seizure, but he had to call 911 and paramedics come. Um, this seizure did scare me. I um, finally got diagnosed with actual epilepsy. Epilepsy is a weird um, disease because it's hard to diagnose. It's hard to figure out why you have seizures or what makes you have seizures. So it took some time to get the diagnosis. Um, I remember being mad. I was only like 22 and I felt like it wasn't fair. I was too young to not be able to party anymore. Um, so I was aggravated. Um, I didn't drink for a year again. I did not do any more shards. I had this great mindset that, well, uppers make you have seizures. Benzos make you have seizures, so just don't do those two. Um, you know, a couple years went by. I started drinking again. Um, I started, I got into opiates. Back then, um, it was like oxys, so I was doing those a lot. Um, they're super expensive and they got harder to find. So I um, kind of was looking for other things to do. Um, I was with one of my friends one night and my friend said, hey, I have this stuff, do you wanna try it? It's free. Uh, you know, like I said, free was one of those words that pretty much made me say yes. And it was heroin. So I did a little bit of it. I remember, um, kind of felt like I got wrapped up in a warm blanket. Like, I felt really good, but it did make me super itchy, and I made me get sick, which that part I really hated. But um, I did enjoy how I felt. And you know, the oxys were getting expensive. It was hard to find them, and like, it was just crazy how much you paid for them. So in my head, this made more sense to just do this substance. Um, the tricky thing with heroin is you're addicted like the first time you do it. So like the next morning I was sick. Um, I didn't want to tell my family why because this was at least 11 years ago. And in Claremont County 11 years ago, heroin was very taboo. It wasn't common. People were, really weren't doing it and they associated heroin with like junkies, homeless people, prostitutes. So, you know, it was a, a drug that I did, um, that I hid. Like, my family knew about everything else I was doing. Um, I won't say they didn't care. I was just an adult, so, you know, what could they do? Um, so I was a very functioning heroin addict. Like, I would do a little every day. I always snorted it. I did not, um, I did not shoot it or smoke it. Um, I was one of those addicts that liked to snort things. So I got, um, I got into that. I was still drinking every weekend. Um, I didn't think my drinking was a big deal because I only drank on weekends. But um, my dad, he used to say, you know, normal people don't black out, Jesse. Like, that's what alcoholics do. And I was like, no, I only drink on the weekends. It's not a big deal. So um, this, w this went on for a while, but Every single time I drank, I would either fall a whole bunch, I would lose my shoes. I've lost my shoes at a bar one night and had to be carried out. Um, I hurt myself so much. Like I was probably the clumsiest drunk you'll ever know. Like there was one time I, I liked to lock myself in bathrooms when I drank. And there was one night I locked myself in a buddy's bathroom to pee. I fell off the toilet head first into the tub my head hit the porcelain soap holder in the shower and shattered it. 
Um, so I'm, you know, flailing around upside down in this tub, and my friend had to break down his own bathroom door to get me. And this, occurrences like this were super normal for me. Um, there was a night I fell out of a car, like my buddy pulled over so I could get sick, and I fell out of his car face first into a gravel driveway. Uh, he picked me up and put me back in the car, and as soon as he sat back in the car, I did it again. So I woke up the next morning, face was just tore up from all this gravel. And like I said, you would think these instances were enough to make me stop, and they never were. I would just be like, well, I'll just drink um, this type of alcohol, and I won't use a straw. Like there was always some sort of method I was trying to find to make my using not as bad. And um, also, my mother, uh, my mother was one of my biggest enablers, and that's not her fault. Um, I've learned a lot of people in recovery are enablers. I suffer from it too, but I was able to go to my mom and I could get her to give me benzos. I could tell her, hey, I have cramps, or hey, I have a headache, hey, it's Tuesday. Whatever excuse I could find, um, she would give me benzos. She would give me marijuana. Like I was very manipulative and I was, so it was more my fault than hers, but I liked to save these benzos to drink with because then I only had to have one or two drinks to reach the level of drunk I wanted. Um, you know, to this day, I haven't drank in 11 years and I still, it still blows my mind to see people that wanna have one beer with dinner because they enjoy the taste of it. That's never made sense to me. Like, I wanted the effect, the fastest way I could get the effect. I didn't ever care what it tasted like. I just wanted to be drunk. Um, same with substances. I just wanted to get messed up as soon as possible. Um, so, you know, I went through a lot. Um, I did end up having another seizure. At the time, I was working at KDI assembling explosives for missiles, which I thought was the coolest job ever. Um, but I was feeling weird all day. Like, when I started using heroin, I stopped caring about taking my seizure medicine. I wasn't sleeping good. I was barely eating. And I just would go to work and just didn't care about much. So all day long, I was stuttering. I was twitching. I felt like things weren't okay. So I got my boss to send me home. I was staying with a buddy at the time, and he came home from work. And I had a phone, my phone in one hand, and I had a bowl in the other hand. I was about to smoke, and I started stuttering. And I had told him I didn't feel right, and he was like, oh, you're fine. So when I started stuttering, he started making fun of me, and that's all I remember. And that was probably my worst seizure. Um, I was told that I pissed myself. Uh, I stopped breathing. Luckily, my buddy was CPR trained, so he gave me, he like gave me mouth to mouth and kept me going till the paramedics got there. All I remember is being in the ambulance and having my finger pricked again. Um, and this kind of, I looked out of the ambulance and saw my buddy crying. This guy was a big, a big tough guy, like huge in stature, um, did not show much emotion. So seeing him crying was crazy. Um, they ran some tests like they did an EEG and an MRI. And when they did the MRI, they found I had a brain condition. It's called an Arnold Chiari malformation. Uh, your cerebellum sits on your spine and it blocks spinal fluid from flowing correctly in your spine. I was falling over, I was tipping, I had really bad headaches, and it was all from this condition. So I was told I needed to have brain surgery. At this time, I think I was either 27 or 28. I'd never had surgery before, and the thought of having brain surgery was terrifying. Um, my dad was with me the day I found out I had to have brain surgery, and that's how he found out I was doing heroin, was at that neurology appointment. Um, the neurologist asked me what kind of drugs I was doing. He said, I need to know because if you go under anesthesia on certain drugs, you can die. So I said I was using heroin. My dad was not expecting to hear that, and I hate that that's how he had to find out. Um, but I did 
quit cold turkey so that I could get this surgery. I was still drinking, doing pills, um, smoking marijuana. I even had a, basically a farewell party at the bar just in case I had this surgery and came back not myself. I wanted to have like a big party that, you know, I could have fun with my friends just in case I came back and wasn't Jesse. That's crazy that anybody would want to have a party at the bar before brain surgery, but you know, that's addicts and alcoholics, we think differently. Um, I had the surgery, it was awful. Um, I was in the hospital, I think for four days, and then I had to go home. Um, the way they do the surgery is they cut from the back. So they took like the neck muscles, like cut through my neck, took some neck muscles out, um, lip, put a pad that lifted my cerebellum up off my spine, and then put everything back in there and glued it. Um, it made my throat super swollen, so I couldn't eat unless someone was at my house with me because anything I ate, I could see going down my esophagus because of the swelling. Um, and one of the other things, they gave me a ginormous bottle of Percocets to go home with. And, you know, being an addict, I'd, I'd never took anything as directed. As long as I still had pain, I ate another one. So I have no idea, you know, how many, I just know they didn't last that long. And I tried to get more and they were like, no. So, um, but I hadn't done heroin in this time period. Um, I think I went like almost a year without doing heroin and decided, you know, I was with my friend again and they said, hey, you haven't done this in a while. Do you want some, it's free. And I did not say no to free. I decided to do it. Um, again, I was a super functioning addict. I was going to beauty school. Um, I was, you know, a good friend. I had, I kind of lived a double life. Like I had friends from beauty school and friends I would go out with and I'd be around my family and none of them knew. And then I'd have the few friends I would use with and I couldn't go anywhere because when I was on heroin, everyone knew. I was scratching my face off, um, like getting sick. So you, anybody that looked at me would immediately know something was wrong. I would not come home until I was sick. So I would come home being emotionally like mean, grumpy, irritable. And like my family just thought I was suffering from um, like my depression stuff. So they had no idea. Um, so this went on for a little while. Um, you know, and I have really bad ADD, so I skip around. So sorry if I'm jumping all over the place. Um, my senior year in high school, I had been sexually assaulted at a party and, um, that was like trauma I'd never worked on. And then, um, right before I started using heroin, I was sexually assaulted again. This was by a really good friend's boyfriend. Um, um, I was drunk and he was the designated driver and, um, I woke up, I had no idea what happened to me. Like I knew something happened, but I didn't know what. And, um, I tried to tell my friend what had happened and it totally backfired. Like back then I had a answering machine. She was calling me nonstop. She was calling my work nonstop, um, threatening to kill me, saying if, if you didn't get so drunk, this, these things wouldn't happen to you. This is your fault. Um, the, the harassment I got was unbelievable. So um, I had to move from Claremont County because I was unsafe. I tried going to the police. The police really wouldn't do anything. Um, so it was probably about a year to the day this sexual assault happened was my first suicide attempt. Um, it was around Valentine's Day and I had just been masking and masking and masking and um, I was sleeping with people. I did not care what happened to me. Um, and I just decided to take a whole bunch of over-the-counter sleeping pills. Uh, at this time, I was living with my grandma. I was her caregiver, which was awful because of the condition I was in. So I ate all these pills. Um, luckily, one of my friends called Poison Control. And Poison Control called the police. 
Um, when the police got there, I uh, was so messed up from these sleeping pills. I couldn't write, I couldn't talk. I just kept moving my hands around because there was these crazy tracers for moving my hands around. Um, they took me to the emergency room. Um, suicide attempts are super embarrassing as is, but then when, when you get put in a room and you can't shut the door and you have someone that basically babysits you, um, they made me drink charcoal, which was the consistency of warm melted toothpaste and it was gritty, um, it was disgusting. I drank this charcoal, it was black. Um, the minute you drink it, it just exits your body. And they gave me this small little bedpan to get sick in and it was just not enough. It was a super um, traumatic and embarrassing experience. Um, I ended up in the psych ward for three days. Um, I did not want to stop drinking or doing stuff, so they would not treat my mental health disorders um, because I wasn't willing to do what I needed to do. So after this happened, um, I was doing a lot of stuff. Like I was getting drunk and sleeping around with men. Um, I didn't care. I'd had you know the trauma from a child, the trauma when I was in high school and then this trauma, I felt like I'd been thrown away like garbage and that that was my value. So I did not care what happened to me. I did not care what I put in my body, who I was around, if people were driving me around under the influence, like wasted, I didn't care about any of it. Um, it was a very, very reckless lifestyle I had. Um, luckily, I never drove for any of this stuff. So um, I never, you know, was in danger to other people in a vehicle. Um, and I was still, when I was using the heroin, um, I was still using a small amount, still not shooting up. So I didn't think it was a big deal. Um, I remember the last time I used, back then overdoses really weren't that common. Um, a girl had passed away, I think a couple weeks prior from an overdose and I was sitting there really high. I could not stop scratching my face. Um, I couldn't even send a text. There was these people in my friend's house. I had no idea who they were. Um, and I, all I could think of was, what if I overdose? And this is how my family finds out that I was using again is when I'm dead. So I decided I did not want that anymore. Um, I left, went back to my mom's house. Um, quick cold turkey, heroin, but I was still smoking weed. Um, I was in a very uncomfortable living situation. My mom was a hoarder. Her boyfriend's an alcoholic, she's an alcoholic. Um, my bed was in the living room. So trying to uh, detox off of heroin by yourself with um, family members yelling at you that you're a junkie, um, just said horrible things, which I understand. Like. Even though we are all addicted to stuff, my, it's easier to point out that someone else's addiction is worse than yours based on the substances. Um, I had started going to 12-step meetings, but I hadn't um, stopped smoking weed yet. Like things just weren't clicking yet. Um, so it was probably Christmas Eve of 2010. Um, I'd gone to school all day and then I went to an Alcathon at Eastgate Holiday Inn and when I came home my mom's boyfriend was really drunk. Um, sometimes when he got really drunk he did not like me. I, I'm not really sure why but I, he just did not like me and that night he did not like me and things got physical. I don't really know how to fight so um, he was like pushing me and screaming at me and I would just push him back. I smacked him a few times, I scratched him. That's really all I knew how to do. Um, and at this time I was totally sober. Um, I'd been given Christmas money that night from my dad. So I had Christmas money in my pocket. Dealing with this situation, like uh, I said some terrible things to him. Um, I was terrified. But the only place I had to go was the house where I used heroin, and I didn't want to do that. So one of my um, 
my brother's childhood friends came down and he, he's not with us anymore, but he saved me that night. He sat next to my bed all night long and protected me so that my mom's boyfriend didn't um, say or do anything else to me. So I made it through the night, um, you know, went to Christmas at my family's. On Christmas Day that night, I went to a 12-step meeting and I was sobbing and asking for experience, strength, and hope on what to do in my situation. I was told to go to a shelter. So uh, that year, Christmas Day was on a Saturday. I stayed the night with someone in the program's house and Monday I called um, the YWCA in Claremont County and they have a battered women's home in Claremont County where they take women and children. Um, I was able to go to the shelter. I was grateful, but um, I didn't have anything but the clothes on my back. They had a curfew. Nobody could come pick me up or know where I was um, in protection of everyone that was staying there. Um, you know, I was almost 30 days sober at this time. So when I ended up in a shelter, I was furious. I was like, you know, you got clean and ended up homeless. Like that, that sucks. So I was very angry and very resentful, but I kept going to meetings. Um, I kept working like with my counselor, caseworker at, um, it used to be called Claremont Counseling Center. Now it's GCBH, but I had a, a caseworker that helped me get an apartment. Um, so I was at this shelter for a couple months until I got my own place. I remember when it first happened, I hinted around to my dad, like, hey, I need a place to stay, but I didn't want to ask him. Um, he told me, I, I, I really wish you could stay with us, but you can't. Um, so I remember I was mad at him for a little while because I felt like I was sober and he should have given me a place to stay, but I never really said how I felt. Um, Looking back now, I'm super grateful he didn't give me a place to stay because being in that shelter, doing all the things I needed to do for my recovery and my mental health helped me be fully self-supporting on my own. Like I needed, I needed that time period to grow. The shelter was very uncomfortable though because other women were using, um, not paying attention to their kids. Like I don't have any kids, so one night, one of the girl's toddlers covered themselves in desitin and she was asleep and I had to go tell like the, we had a lady, we always had someone that worked at the shelter around the clock. So I had to tell the lady like, hey, um, she's asleep and her kid has got desitin everywhere. I don't know what to do. Cause since it wasn't my kid, I wasn't gonna clean it, cleaning them up. Um, but I got out of the shelter, got into my own place. I was staying clean. Um, through a 12-step program. Uh, I met another him. This was my first relationship clean. Um, I thought I could save him. Um, I made him my higher power. I, I spent all of my time and energy trying to make him better. Uh, he only went to meetings to shut me up, which, you know, I didn't realize that at the time. Um, it was very unhealthy. Like I said, he kept using, he was lying about the using, so I was always worried about what he was doing. Um, he was using in my house. Um, he was also emotionally and mentally abusive. Um, he would like burn stuff at my house. Um, one night I was at work and he decided to read all my step work. And after reading my step work, he punched holes in my apartment walls. He smeared blood everywhere. Um, he just terrorized my apartment. When I got home that night, he screamed in my face all night. Um, it was just a very toxic relationship. Uh, at this time, I was almost two years clean and um, I was emotionally tired. I was tired from dealing with him, but not strong enough to leave him. So I decided to, I wanted to smoke marijuana. Um, when you're very open and honest about being clean, it is impossible to find somebody that will sell you drugs, or it was for me. It took me a whole day of trying to find drugs. And um, I started sharing with my friends in recovery how I was feeling. Um, they were like, you need to go to a meeting. 
So they took me to a meeting. I shared at the meeting. After the meeting, everybody was like, do you feel better? I was like, no, I'm still gonna smoke weed. Um, I waited too long to talk about it. I'd already made up my mind. I just didn't realize it. Um, that night, I did find somebody to sell me weed. And I remember that night I had this idea that I was gonna smoke one joint, not say anything, um, keep my clean time date, just was gonna act like nothing happened. And then that little voice in my head was like, well, you can't just smoke one joint. You just, you had almost two years. You need to, you need to smoke more, you need to do more. So um, I did, I smoked for about a month and you know, I didn't have any bad memories of marijuana, so I didn't really think it would make my life unmanageable. I was like, it's not a big deal. But um, towards the end of that month, I was digging for change in the couch so I could buy more weed. Because the way I smoked, I smoked all of it and wanted more. Um, I remember I ended up at the psych ward again because of this, this man, we had a really, bad fight that night and I was just tired. So I went to the psych ward, but they didn't keep me because I was not suicidal, um, which it's kind of a breath of fresh air when the, when the psych nurses say you're not crazy enough to stay. Um, luckily, this guy went to jail for some things he was doing while he was using. And my brother called me one night and um, anyone that knows me knows I'm obsessed with music and I have a few artists that are my top favorites and Yellow Wolf is one of them. Well, my brother, he was like, well, Yellow Wolf's coming to Cleveland. Um, I know you're gonna wanna go. I know you're gonna need a ticket and a ride. So if you throw your weed out um, and stay clean, I will buy your ticket and give you a ride. I said, absolutely not. I'm not gonna throw my weed out, but I won't buy any more. So I did just that. Um, I did smoke what I had left. Um, I didn't buy any more. So that's why my, my clean date is October 3rd, 2012. Um, I remember going back to a meeting and getting my white key tag. And I remember it didn't feel the same. Like, you know, when you're using, you're always chasing that first high. I think sometimes that can be the same in recovery. Like the first meeting I went to, um, like really gave it my all. I felt acceptance and love and I, it was almost like a high. So when I came back from this relapse and went in, I didn't feel that. And something told me just to hang in there. And I think a lot of people don't realize that after a relapse, you, you have to stick it out until you feel better. And I'm really grateful I did. Um, I went through a few more, you know, bad relationships, um, but I stayed, I stayed clean. I was, I was kind of dabbling in both fellowships. Um, NA is where it really clicked for me though. Um, I got to learn a lot about myself. I was doing step work. I have done the steps twice in AA. Um, so I, I have a better understanding of myself. I was like doing things for others. Um, trying to be of maximum service, going to meetings. Um, so like life was really good for a while. Um, I have had three surgeries clean. Um, I've been through a lot. Like I lost my stepmom to cancer. I think she, it's been almost two years or might've been two years since she's passed away. Um, but like I, I have really good, I have a really good relationship I'm in. I'm in the first healthy relationship I've ever been in. We communicate, we don't argue, um, we are a team. It's very healthy. Um, he is not in recovery like, you know, his recovery is not the same as everyone else's. Like he um, is a little different than me. He drinks occasionally, he does other, like, you know, he smokes. It doesn't bother me. Um, it doesn't bother my recovery. I've been with him over a year and a half now and, you know, am still clean. I don't say that'll work for everybody, but it works for me. Um, I'm a peer recovery supporter at a hospital today. So I get to, you know, share experience, strength, and hope to help others in their recovery. Uh, I have a really good relationship with my dad. I'm um, very close with, you know, my boyfriend's mom. Um, 
I haven't talked to my mother since May because I um, just had to set some boundaries and it sucks, but um, I've come to a point in my life where peace is all I want and I will do anything and everything to get the level of peace I have. Um, I do therapy every week. I take medications for my mental health. You know, a lot of people in recovery are duly diagnosed and I think one of the biggest problems is we work on one or the other. We don't work on both at the same time. Um, through a lot of emotional pain, I've had to figure out that I have to work on both. Um, my anxiety used to take over my life. It would affect my relationship, my social life, my family life, everything, and it's so much better now. Um, I go to raves all the time and I don't ever want to use, like I'm so grateful that I can still enjoy the culture that I loved so much back then without drugs. Um, I go to lots of concerts, I travel, like, you know, my life is, is better than it's ever been. And I may not do 12-step recovery anymore, but 12-step recovery saved my life. It absolutely saved my life. I'm able to look at my part in things. Um, I'm able to try to do stuff for others every day. I don't have to tell anybody about it. Um, so, you know, if you're struggling, recovery is not a one size fits all. There are so many programs. There's Celebrate Recovery, Smart Recovery, NA, AA. There's Medicated Assisted Recovery Anonymous. Um, find something that works for you. And if you're not finding it, keep looking. Like, too many people are dying. We're all worth more than our rest and peace status on Facebook. Um, life in recovery is so much better. Even the bad stuff. Like, you know, I have a lot of health issues right now. I'm having to see uh, a GI specialist and I need to see, I have to see a spinal deformity specialist next week. And I'm still okay. I don't wanna use, I'm happy. I'm going to Texas on a mini trip at the end of the week. Like, life is really good for me. And without recovery, I wouldn't have any of that. So that's all I have.